The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we will explore several important questions and answers which will hopefully give us a better scriptural understanding of the topic of prayer. As we open our discussion and study of prayer, I invite you to join me in making mental note of our your own initial understanding of what is the proper purpose of prayer. The reasoning is not that anyone need feel shame or embarrassment. Rather, we recognize that there is often great confusion and misunderstanding about the true nature and proper understanding of the role of prayer. In point of fact, prayer is and remains an inexhaustible frontier of opportunity, promise, and discovery regarding the riches and majesty of God for His people. It is a subject about which the Bible has more to say about than perhaps any other subject, since at its heart it deals with a relationship between God and His children. People approach prayer in many ways. Some have the idea that prayer is like rubbing Aladdin's lamp and expecting God to act in character to the genie who grants every wish. Others see prayer akin to some lottery or gambling scheme where we are left to the whims of random chance or luck. Worst of all, some believe that successful prayer is predicated upon earning favor from God through good behavior, or at least avoiding bad. In any case, for most, the presumptive goal of prayer is to obtain something wanted, needed, or prevent something which ostensibly only God can alleviate. While this may in many cases be a legitimate goal, as we shall see, the primary goal may be altogether different. Let's pray. Father, we pray that through this study, your spirit and your grace would lead us and guide us unto deeper abiding relationship with you. We pray that by your spirit and power that you would help us to yield ourselves to hear and receive your word, which are the words of eternal life, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So let's ask some basic questions which will hopefully help us to better understand the proper biblical context and purpose of prayer. Our questions are as follows. 1. What is the proper biblical definition of the word prayer? 2. Are there any prerequisites necessary for a person to successfully pray? 3. Is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer, or does God answer every prayer without regard? 4. Is there a formula to be found for successful prayer? 5. What, if anything, does prayer change? Does prayer change God's mind, or is it man who conforms his mind to God's? 6. If a prayer goes unanswered, does this mean that there is some problem with the person petitioning? 7. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? 8. Is there any difference between private and public prayer? And finally, 9. Can prayer literally move a mountain? Let's begin with question 1. What is the proper biblical definition of the word pray? Now, there are several Greek and Hebrew words from which we get the English word pray or prayer. Both the Hebrew and the Greek words in question mean to pray, to entreat, to intercede, to ask, to make request, to desire, to beseech, to entreat, to exhort or make supplication. Now, as we shall see, when we articulate a theologically complete and biblically correct definition of prayer, we find that prayer is defined in context as one or more persons who earnestly communicate and petition God through a relationship with His Son, Jesus. Properly motivated, these petitions seek to humble the petitioner or petitioners in an effort to move the condition and or situation of the imperfect petitioner into alignment with God's will, which is always perfect. Next we have question two. Are there any prerequisites necessary for a person to successfully pray? The answer is yes. The heart, spirit, motivation, mindset, and attitude of the petitioner are critical. As we consider the prerequisites necessary for successful prayer, I submit that we may identify at least six beliefs drawn from Scripture that believers must make consciously or unconsciously when we pray in order to be successful. These qualifying beliefs are as follows. 1. God exists. 2. God created man. 3. God desires a relationship with his creation, i.e. man. 4. God has a plan for our lives. 5. God knows our needs as well as the desires of our heart. And 6. God anticipated and created a mechanism such as prayer to have fellowship and to better our relationship with him. Having quickly stated these qualifying beliefs, let's take a closer look at the six beliefs from a scriptural standpoint. Number one, God exists. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, quote, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, i.e. he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him." Unquote. 2. God created man. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, quote, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Unquote. 3. God desires relationship with his creation, i.e. man. John chapter 6 verse 40 says, quote, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Unquote. Also, John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, quote, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did not receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, unquote. 4. God has a plan for our lives. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, quote, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope, unquote. Also Romans chapter 8 verse 28, which says, quote, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose, unquote. 5. God knows our needs as well as the desires of our heart. Psalm chapter 139, verse 2 says, quote, Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off, unquote. Also, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, which say, quote, And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Unquote. 6. God anticipated and created a mechanism such as prayer to have fellowship and to better our relationship with him. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says, quote, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Unquote. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, quote, Pray without ceasing. Unquote. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, quote, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God." And finally, Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, "...watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak." Question 3. Is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer or does God answer every prayer without regard? Let's break up the question into two parts. Part A. Is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer? This question deals with the core nature and character of God in juxtaposition to the nature and character of man. The problem is that what we know of God we know only as a result of God's having revealed it to man. What we know of man is twofold. One, we know what we know of ourselves via our own introspection as well as historical record. Whatever results we find regarding what we know of man, the conclusions are clouded as a result of the effects of sin. Two, we have God's word and God's indwelling spirit available which reveal various characteristics of our nature to us. Regarding God's answering prayer, many would accuse God of being arbitrary, ineffective, capricious, inattentive, or unfaithful when it comes to answering prayer. The inevitable proof of this fact is found by those lodging such complaints is the supposed fact that God has not answered some prayer they have offered. Still others find ostensible proof that God does not answer prayer in the fact that evil and or suffering exists. In the first case, in order to understand such profound concepts such as evil and suffering would require placing such terms into their proper context. It would only be after we do so that we could hope to attribute the existence of such things to whether or not God answers prayer. Unfortunately, the constraints of time here prohibit any worthy discussion of evil and or suffering. However, I would direct those who are interested to the episode entitled The Problem of Evil for their listening regarding this subject. In the second case, 
concluding that God does not exist, uh, that God does not care, or that prayer is ineffective because of any single person, or even a group of people's prayers have not been answered, assumes a host of facts not in evidence. In order to have all the facts, we would need to stand in eternity with the same knowledge as God. In the end, such conclusions that God does not effectively answer prayer, or that prayer itself is faulty, only holds merit so long as man judges the matter from his finite perspective. In order to break out from the trap of relative subjective rationales born of natural man and his rebellion, we must look to scripture to find those basis which affect the dialogue of successful prayer. Here are a few verses from Scripture which comment on the issues which affect our dialogue of prayer. 1. Selfish Motives, James chapter 4, verse 3, quote, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, and that ye may consume it upon your lusts, unquote. 2. Iniquity, Psalm chapter 66, verse 18, quote, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, unquote. 3. Sin, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 12, quote, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear, unquote. John chapter 9, verse 31, quote, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him, unquote. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, quote, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, unquote. 4. Dishonoring God, Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, quote, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name? And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Unquote. 5. Forsaking God. Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Quote, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people, for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by famine and by the pestilence. Unquote. 6. Rebellion. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. Quote, but they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Unquote. 7. Selfishness. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. Quote, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Unquote. 8. Unholiness. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Quote, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them, 
And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood, unquote. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 3, quote, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness." Unquote. 9. Idolatry Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 13 through 14. Quote, For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense in, unto Baal. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time when they cry unto me for their trouble." Unquote. 10. Lack of Faith James chapter 1, verse 6 through 7 quote, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not a man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord." Unquote. And 13. Self-righteousness Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, say, quote, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted." Unquote. This concludes part one of our study. Please join me for part two. Thank you for listening. The world falls